This is Acolyte, Bound by Blood, Book Two, by Richard Fierce. Narrated by Kevin E. Green. Chapter One Kai walked in the shadows of the great statues that loomed around the temple courtyard, dragons with furled wings and riders whose eyes were fixed on the horizon, seeing things that were lost to time. A gust of wind stirred the dust on the cobblestones, carrying with it the faint scent of smoke. Ahead, Leo waited for her. His posture was relaxed but alert, and his sword hung loosely in his hand, the blade glinting in the early morning light of the sun. Kai could see the calmness in his eyes, the patience of a warrior who had seen countless battles. She drew her blade, and the metal sang as it came free of the scabbard, the sound sharp and clear in the stillness. Ready? Leo asked. His tone was soft, but there was a hint of something more, an edge that told her this would not be an easy session. Kai nodded, mirroring his stance. He moved first, a swift, fluid motion that brought his sword arcing toward her with precision. Kai met the strike with her own blade, the clash of metal ringing out through the courtyard. The impact reverberated up Kai's arm, but she held firm, pushing back against Leo's strength. They moved in a dance of steel, each strike and parry a show of skill. Leia was faster, more experienced, but Kai had her own strengths. She was learning to anticipate his moves, to read the subtle shifts in his stance that signalled his next attack. Very good, Leo said. Don't just react, think ahead. Where will my next strike come from? Kai tightened her grip on the hilt of her sword. She saw the flicker in Leo's eyes, the slight shift of his weight, and she moved, bringing her sword up to block his next strike. Their blades locked, and for a moment they were face to face. Better, but you're still focusing on defence. Take the initiative. Leo pushed her back with a forceful shove. Kai took a deep breath, forcing her anger down. She shifted her position, her eyes searching for an opening. Leo was right, she was too reactive, too cautious. She needed to take control, to direct the pace of the fight. Feigning a strike to Leo's left, he moved to block her, but she shifted her weight, bringing her blade around in a sweeping arc toward his right. Leo's eyes widened slightly in surprise, but he recovered quickly, parrying the blow. "'You're learning well,' he said with approval. Guy didn't let the compliment distract her. She pressed the attack, her strikes coming faster, more aggressively. Leo's blade met each one, but Kai could see she was pushing him now, forcing him to adjust. They moved across the courtyard, their swords flashing, the clang of metal resonating off the temple. Kai could feel the strain in her muscles, the burn of exertion, but she pushed through it, driven by the desire to prove herself. Leo's expression remained unreadable, but there was something in his eyes, pride perhaps, or respect. It was hard to tell, but it gave her the strength to keep going, to push herself even harder. Finally, Leo stepped back, lowering his blade. Kai hesitated, her chest heaving with exertion, but she lowered her blade as well, sensing the sparring session had come to an end. "'You're improving,' Leo said. "'But remember, Draka are formidable enemies, and strength alone won't win your battles. They will outmatch you every time.' You need to outsmart and outmanoeuvre your opponent. Above all, trust your instincts. Kai nodded, wiping the sweat from her brow with the back of her right hand. She knew he was right. There was still so much to learn, but each session with him brought her closer to mastering the skills she needed to be sworn. With Leo teaching her to fight and Kokoro guiding her in the strengthening of her bond, she knew she would be ready when the time came. Sensing a shift in the air, Kai turned to see Kokoro. She walked with measured steps and joined them. Leo bowed his head in respect and stepped away. Although Kokoro took the form of a human, Kai couldn't deny her presence was undeniably draconic, and the power she radiated was palpable. "'I see your improvement with each day,' she said, nodding at Kai's sword. "'This is easy to navigate,' Kai replied. The bond, less so. The bond is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it becomes. Have you heard her voice yet? No, but I've felt something. Emotions that aren't mine, but they're fleeting. I haven't been able to truly hear her thoughts. 
"'That is the beginning,' Kokoro said, her tone reassuring. "'The bond is still fresh, but you have already progressed further than I expected. "'It won't be long now before she speaks to you. "'Go bathe yourself and meet me here when you're done.' "'Kai sheathed a blade and bowed her head, "'then entered the temple and went to the bathing chamber. "'The warm water cleansed her body, "'but her mind was consumed with the thoughts of her dragon. "'If Kokoro was right,' She would hear her dragon's voice any day now. Still doubts lingered. After spending her entire life not hearing the dragon that had originally chosen her, it was hard to believe that her experience now would be any different. She emerged from the bath feeling refreshed. After drying and clothing herself, she returned to the courtyard where Kokoro waited. Kai's dragon was there too, and her golden scales shimmered in the sunlight. With each breath... Puffs of steam escaped her nostrils, curling and dissipating into the morning air. "'Today we are going to try something different,' Kokoro said. "'Close your eyes.' Kai obeyed, and she traced her fingers along the material of her pants, searching for a seam to run under her nails. "'Stop that,' Kokoro said. "'Quiet your mind and focus on your connection to your dragon. Do not force it. Let it come to you naturally.' Kai inhaled a deep breath and pushed all her thoughts aside. She imagined her bond as a thread of light, gold like her dragon scales. It pulsed with life and energy. For a long moment there was nothing but silence. Then she felt it. A gentle nudge at the edge of her consciousness, like a whisper carried on the wind. It was faint, almost imperceptible, but it was there. Kai's heart quickened as her dragon chirruped, but she forced herself to stay calm. There was no voice, but there was a presence. A feeling washed over her, more powerful than any spoken language. Kai's breath caught in her throat. She'd not felt her dragon's spirit so clearly before. It was as though a door had been opened between them, allowing them to step into a place where their thoughts could meet. Kai reached out hesitantly, the response came almost immediately, a wave of warmth that filled her with a sense of peace. She felt the true essence of her dragon, noble, fierce, strong. A rush of raw emotions flooded her mind, pride, love, determination, all amplified by the bond. It was overwhelming, but it was also beautiful. An unspoken word came to her, and she slowly opened her eyes to see Kokoro watching her intently. My dragon's name is Hikari. Chapter 2 Hikari. It meant light, which Kai found fitting considering how her scales seemed to glow. A beautiful name, Kokoro said, glancing at the dragon. Your connection is growing stronger, but it is still a fragile thing. To forge it into something unbreakable... You must face trials that challenge each of you, both physically and mentally. What sort of challenges? Kokoro's eyes turned skyward for a moment, before settling back on Kai. The skies are the domain of dragons. To truly understand, Hikari, to trust in your bond, you must take to the air together. You must learn to fly as one. The words sent a jolt of fear through Kai's chest, Flying, something she had always admired from the ground, was frightening. She had flown on the back of Siron's dragon to come to the temple, but that was a dragon with years of experience riding the skies. Hikari was practically a hatchling. I sense your fear, Kokoro said. It is a natural response for humans, but it is one you must master. What if I can't? What if I fall? You are not alone in this. Hikari will be with you. You will need to trust in her just as she will need to trust in you. Kai felt a steadying presence wrap around her mind. Hikari's confidence flowed into her, pushing the fear aside. Kai nodded, inhaling a deep breath. I will guide you through this, Kokoro said. Hikari lowered her massive body to the ground to allow Kai to climb onto her back. With trembling hands, Kai approached, running her fingers over the dragon's smooth scales. 
She could feel the dragon's strength beneath her touch, a living, breathing force of nature that she was now linked to. Kai hoisted herself on to Hikari's back and settled into place at the base of her neck, just ahead of her shoulders. The fear was still present, but it was overshadowed by Hikari's confidence. The dragon spread her wings wide, their span casting shadows on the cobblestones. With a powerful beat she lifted off the ground, and Kai watched the earth fall away from her. For a brief moment panic made her stomach twist, but it was quickly smothered by the exhilaration that surged through her as they soared higher into the sky. The wind whipped, tugging at her clothes and hair, but she barely noticed. Her entire being was focused on the sensation of flight, the rhythm of Hikari's wings, the rise and fall of their movements, the way the world below grew smaller and smaller until it was nothing but a patchwork of green and brown. Kai's heart raced, but not from fear. The sky stretched out before them, an open expanse of possibility, and for the first time she felt a sense of freedom she had never experienced before. She couldn't help but laugh. Focusing her thoughts on the bond, she sent words through it. This is amazing. I never thought I could feel like this. The bond hummed with harmony, and Kai knew that Hikari shared her feelings. The world around them blurred as they entered the clouds, but they parted to reveal the vast blue above. Tears pricked at Kai's eyes, both from the sting of the cold and the pure unfiltered emotion she felt. This was what it meant to be bonded to a dragon, to share not only thoughts and feelings but experiences, to face the unknown together. An unfamiliar voice touched Kai's mind, but she soon realised it was Kokoro. It is easy to fly in clear skies, but you must be prepared for the worst. Look southeast toward the mountains. Kai turned her head, and her eyes widened. Dark clouds swirled ominously, and lightning flickered within them, casting brief, jagged illuminations across the mountain peaks. I see a storm, Kai said. The bond is tempered with adversity. Fly through the storm. The thought of flying into such dangerous conditions brought a forgotten fear back to the surface. But we've only just flown together for the first time. What if... What if you succeed? What if you learn to trust in your bond even when the world around you is in chaos? This is not about mastering flight in calm skies. This is about learning to trust one another. Kai swallowed hard, her throat dry. She knew she needed to strengthen the bond, but flying into a storm seemed a treacherous way to do so. Hikari's presence filled her mind again, calming her. You're right, she told Hikari. We can do this. Hikari circled around and headed directly for the storm. The air grew cooler as they approached the dark clouds, and the first gusts of wind hit them like a wall. Hikari's wings strained against the turbulence, and Kai could feel the tension in the dragon's muscles. She let out a mighty roar, fighting to keep herself on course as the wind threatened to throw them sideways. The scent of rain and ozone was sharp in Kai's nostrils. Lightning flashed around them, followed by the deafening crack of thunder. Kai tightened her grip around Hikari's neck, but it was too thick for her arms to fully encircle. She closed her eyes and reached through the bond with her mind, trying to feel what Hikari was feeling. The currents of the wind, the shift of the air pressure, the instinctive adjustments the dragon made to stay aloft. Slowly she began to sink with Hikari's rhythm, letting the dragon's instincts guide them through the storm. They dodged several lightning strikes as Hikari banked sharply to avoid the dangerous currents that could send them spiralling out of control. Kai was still afraid, but the emotion was muted by her growing trust in Hikari. She could feel the dragon's confidence, a strength, and it bolstered her own. Feeling brave, she opened her eyes. Suddenly a powerful gust of wind caught them from below, lifting them higher than Kai had expected. For a terrifying moment she felt weightless, the sensation of falling upward sending a jolt of panic through her. Before she could fully process what was happening, Hikari tucked her wings in and plunged downward, cutting through the wind like a blade. The speed was breathtaking, the air rushing past them in a roar. Kai's heart hammered in her chest, but she held on, trusting completely in Hikari's judgment. 
The dive took them out of the worst of the storm and into a pocket of calmer air. Hikari flared her wings, slowing their descent just as another bolt of lightning streaked across the sky, narrowly missing them. Kai gasped, temporarily blinded from the flash of light. After what felt like an eternity, the storm began to break. The clouds thinned and the rain lessened, revealing patches of clear sky. Hikari's wing beats grew steadier, the turbulence easing as they left the worst of the storm behind. Kai could hardly believe they'd survived. We did it, she said through the bond, feeling a deep sense of accomplishment. Hikari gave a triumphant roar in reply. As they flew back toward the temple, the sun peeked out from the clouds, casting a golden light over the mountains. The experience had changed something within Kai. She could feel it, a tangible difference in the bond. It was stronger, their connection more intimate. When they landed in the courtyard, Kai slid off Hikari's back, her legs shaky. Kokoro smiled at her. You faced the storm and came out stronger for it. This is the essence of the bond between rider and dragon. It is not without fear, but it is through facing that fear together that you find true strength. Kai bowed her head. I understand now. It wasn't just about flying, it was about trusting Hikari, even when it seemed impossible. Forgive me for questioning you. Kokoro laid a hand on Kai's shoulder, a touch warm. There is no need to apologise. You are learning, and to learn one must ask questions. Hikari nuzzled Kai, and a wave of affection passed between them. Get something to eat and take a moment to recuperate. Your next trial awaits. Chapter 3 You must seek out an artefact from ancient times. It is imbued with magic that has long since faded from this world. It is known as the Heart of Flame, and it rests in the heart of fire itself. Kokoro's words echoed in Kai's mind as she sat upon Hikari's back, watching the landscape pass below. Trees and winding rivers slowly gave way to rugged terrain as they approached a mountain with its peak shrouded in a veil of smoke. A volcano. Hikari descended, landing at the base of the mountain where the earth radiated warmth, a harbinger of the inferno that awaited them within. A cavernous moor was open to the world, a passage carved into the mountainside by powerful forces, though whether natural or magical, Kai didn't know. She dismounted and glanced around. The place was so foreboding, she doubted even the Draka dared to tread there. The opening was wide enough even for Hikari's girth, and Kai was thankful she wouldn't have to brave the dangers of the cave alone. "'Are you ready?' she asked, running a hand along Hikari's scales. In response, the dragon stared at her with a knowing gaze, then walked into the darkness. Kai cast a final glance at the sky and followed after Hikari. The air inside the cave was heavy and sulphurous, and Kai's lungs protested the oppressive heat that enveloped her. Hikari's massive silhouette was a reassuring presence against the gloom. The cavern seemed to pulse with the heartbeat of the earth, a rhythmic thudding that matched her own racing heart. Each step took them deeper into the bowels of the volcano, and since Kai was blind in the dark, she was forced to rely on Hikari to guide her. She held on to the tip of her tail, stepping slowly and cautiously lest she slip on some unseen rock. Beads of sweat formed on her brow, trickling down her temples, and her clothes clung to her skin. The heat was sapping her strength and clouding her focus. Kai stopped to rest and leaned against the wall. Hikari halted, and a wave of strength flowed through the bond, reinvigorating Kai. She sent her appreciation to the dragon. There was no need for words. Their bond transcended language. Pushing off the wall, she grabbed hold of Hikari's tail again, and the two continued ahead. Kai wondered if the riders of old had faced similar challenges. Images flashed in her mind, but they weren't quite memories. The scenes were disjointed and confusing, but Kai was able to discern what Hikari was sending her were echoes of the past, moments lost in time that answered her question. Yes, the riders of old had faced challenges, but ones much more difficult than she faced now. 
It was hard to take comfort in that when she felt as though she was suffocating. A tremor ran through the earth beneath her boots, a murmur from the depths that set her heart racing. Somehow she could discern the warning. The chamber they sought might soon become their grave. With the urgency of the mountain's message pulsing through her veins, Kai urged Hikari to quicken her pace. The cavern around them slowly expanded, and the path coiled like a serpent, abruptly ending at an enormous pool of molten rock. The heat was far more intense here, and the air was so acrid it stung Kai's nostrils and made her eyes water. She blinked the tears away and noticed a trail of exposed stones that jutted up from the magma. On the other side of the pool, a luminous beacon flared in the shadows, revealing the entrance to a secondary chamber. Kai had no doubts the beacon was the relic. Its magic called to her. A beckoning siren song that promised both glory and ruin, Hikari leapt into the air and spread her wings, gliding across the pool and landing on the other side. It was obvious the dragon expected her to navigate across on her own. The relentless heat tested the limits of her endurance, but she forced herself to press on. She jumped onto the first stone, waving her arms wildly to help her stay balanced. The other stones were spaced closer together, and she nimbly moved across them. Every movement was a dance with danger, but she crossed the magma without incident. By the time she was safely on the other side, her breaths came in sharp gasps, the air searing her lungs, as if it conspired with the molten rock to burn away her resolve. Sweat dripped freely down her face, and in places she never imagined possible, but she'd made it, and the chamber was just ahead. An aura of heat intensified with every step until she had to stop and fall back. I can't, she hissed. It's too much. Hikari sent images through the bond. They flashed vividly in Kai's mind, but they didn't make any sense to her. She wanted nothing more than to lie down and rest. Hikari growled and more images came to her mind. I don't understand. The dragon turned her gaze directly on Kai, their eyes locking. Another image came to her, and understanding dawned on Kai. She closed her eyes and focused on the bond. The single golden thread was crafted of many smaller threads, all woven together. Kai found the one in the image Hikari had showed her, and she touched it with her mind. A magical shield spiralled into existence around her, a cocoon spun from the threads of their intertwined spirits. The barrier shimmered faintly with blue light, repelling the heat. Kai was still sweaty, but at least now she could breathe. Thank you. I owe you my life. Hikari snorted and shook her head. Kai smiled, then looked at the entrance of the chamber. Together they stepped inside. In the centre of the space was a pedestal hewn from the rock, and lying atop it was an object that bathed the entire chamber in a crimson hue. It was a gemstone the size of Kai's fist, and the pulsing she felt in the air was coming from it. Tentatively, Kai approached and extended a hand toward the relic. The moment her fingertips grazed its sparkling surface, her protective barrier winked out of existence. But instead of feeling the heat return, nothing changed. The chamber began to tremble, and cracks spiderwebbed across the stone walls. It was as though the mountain rumbled at the disturbance of its treasure. Dust and small stones cascaded from the ceiling, and Kai sensed the earth was warning her to flee. Run! Turning on her heels, she sprinted out of the chamber, deftly crossing the pool of magma. She reached the other side and continued through the tunnel, the gemstone lighting the way. Hikari was right behind her, the dragon's footfalls echoing like thunderclaps in the hollow cavern. The path turned treacherous as molten rock oozed from fissures that opened, a glowing menace that hissed and popped. Kai weaved between the obstacles, her agility tested by the earth's convulsions. Her muscles screamed, yet she dared not slow her pace. Each stride took her closer to safety and away from the destructive embrace of the mountain that sought to reclaim its treasure. The ground heaved beneath her, and the sound of stone cracking reverberated throughout the corridor. With a death-winning crash, the path behind her gave way, succumbing to the mountain's wrath. A torrent of rocks and dust billowed into the air as Kai reached the threshold of the volcano's moor. She stumbled forward, propelled by the force of the eruption and Hikari's bulk. 
Her boots found solace on the firm soil beyond the reach of the inferno, and she turned back to see the passage was now a smouldering crater. The path was no more, entombed beneath layers of rock and dirt. "'Are you all right?' Kai asked, looking over Hikari with concern. Their bond burned fiercely, and her eyes widened when Hikari replied, "'I am now.' Chapter 4 High above the clouds, the air was crisp, and the horizon stretched endlessly. Kai enjoyed the cooler temperature, thankful that she and Hikari had escaped the volcano unscathed. She had tucked the heart of flame protectively inside the silk bag Kokoro had given her, and it rested firmly between her thighs while her hands gripped the scales of Hikari's neck. The dragon's golden scales reflected the sun's light, casting a faint rainbow of colour into the surrounding clouds. When Kai was younger, she had often wondered what riding on the back of a dragon would feel like. It was better than anything she had imagined, but hearing Hikari's voice was the ultimate reward. How were you able to show me those images? Are they memories? I think they are, Hikari replied. What do you mean? You don't know for certain? No, they came to me by instinct and I funneled them to you. I think they are memories from other elders. Kai found that intriguing. How would a dragon receive memories from another, especially ones that were no longer around? She had many questions, but she feared she would overwhelm Hikari if she let them pour out unchecked. As our bond strengthens, so do I the dragon said, answering the main question burning in Kai's mind. You can read my thoughts. I can. That made Kai a little uneasy. Did that mean she would never have privacy within her own mind? I will not do it any longer without your permission, but you will need to learn to shield your mind from our bond. Like you, I am still learning, Kai replied. The wind changed direction and the smell of smoke was overpowering. Kai leaned to the left, looking down at the ground below. I smell it too, Hikari said. I hear screams. Can you reach Kokoro? There was a moment of silence before Hikari answered. No, I don't know how to link to her mind. Kai could faintly make out a village near the Tangshou River. Smoke billowed into the air, and she knew something was amiss. We have to help them, Kai said. Can you take me down there? The bond flooded with a mix of concern and pride. Kai thought Ikari would refuse, but the dragon responded with a surge of acceleration and dove, descending toward the village with the swiftness of an arrow. As they got closer, Kai could see the extent of the damage. Thatched roofs succumbed to hungry flames. The roar of the fire mingled with the cries of the terrified villagers who were running in all directions. Hikari landed on the outskirts of the village, and Kai slid off her back, immediately running to the closest group of people. What happened here? A woman turned to face her, soot and tears streaking her face. Draka, she said. They came out of nowhere. Kai glanced around, suddenly afraid. She returned to Hikari and tied the silk bag around the dragon's neck, then drew her ebony blade. Go south, Kai instructed the villagers. Cross the river and turn southwest to Tatanogawa. You'll be safe at the temple. The small group fled past them, and Kai turned her attention to the village. Keep watch for the Draka, she told Hikari. I'll get the other villagers. Without waiting for an answer, Kai hurried across the field and into the village proper. The heat from the flames was intense and threatened to singe her skin. She shouted for people to follow her, directing them towards the river. The acrid smoke filled her nostrils and stung her eyes, but she pressed on, determined to save as many as she could. As she came round a bend, Kai froze. Several bodies lay in the dirt, but they hadn't been killed from the fire. Blood stained the earth beneath them, and, judging by the footprints, they had been victims of a drawker. Tightening her grip on the hilt of her blade, she cautiously continued ahead. 
Sensing movement to her left, she whirled around, bringing her blade up and taking a defensive stance. Through the haze of smoke, a young boy appeared, coughing and gasping for air. His eyes widened at the sight of Kai's sword, but she held out a reassuring hand. "'I'm here to help. Come with me.' The boy accepted her offer and clung to her arm. She led him back the way she'd came, but a drawker emerged from behind a partially collapsed building. It was similar in appearance to the one she'd seen at Ikji, but this one had red skin. Fire, she muttered to herself, realising what had caused the flames. The drawker spotted her, and a sinister grin spread across its face. Kai pushed the boy behind her and braced herself, focusing on the rhythm of her breathing. She had sparred with Leo many times over the last few days, and although she had learned much, she knew she was not prepared to face a drawker on her own. The creature lunged at her, claws outstretched, but Kai deftly slapped its arm aside with a blade. The drawker howled in pain and clutched its arm. Tendrils of smoke drifted off its flesh where her blade had touched it. She hadn't seen it do that before, but she had only trained with Leo. Your sword was forged to destroy Drokka, Ikari said. I can sense the magic imbued within its metal. It hungers for their blood. Emboldened by her dragon's words, she attacked. Her blade struck true and cut a jagged zigzag up the Drokka's forearm. Black blood oozed from the wound. The creature screeched in anger and struck Kai with its fist. The blow knocked her off her feet sending her tumbling along the debris-strewn path. Kai landed hard and gasped for breath as pain shot through her side. Get up, Hikari urged. Kai struggled to her feet, her only concern for the boy who stood defenceless as the drawker approached him. She felt her key flare, pulsing in her veins like a drumbeat. Guided by intuition, she dug her fingers into the dirt and funneled the power she felt into the earth. The ground between the boy and the drawker heaved upward, soil and stone rising to form a wall that intercepted the beast. Kai's amazement didn't last long, as the drawker roared and pummeled the earthen barrier. It held, but Kai wasn't sure how long it would remain. She could feel her strength quickly fading, and suspected the barrier was powered by her key. With its attention diverted, the drawker didn't see Kai until it was too late. She plunged the blade into its back, jerked it sharply, then yanked it free. The drawker let out a guttural scream that echoed throughout the village, its eyes widening in disbelief as it staggered briefly and fell to its knees. Blood spurted from the wound, and the creature fell face first onto the ground, dead. Kai gasped as a sharp pain lanced through her ribcage, and the earthen barrier crumbled. To the river, hurry, Kai urged the boy. He nodded, wide-eyed, and ran off. The world around Kai spun and she dropped her sword. I don't feel so good. The last thing she saw was the ground coming up to meet her. Chapter 5 When Kai opened her eyes, she found herself in an unfamiliar place. She struggled to make sense of the scattered images that flashed through her mind, and Hikari's own barrage of memories only added to her disorientation. What happened? You lost consciousness, Hikari replied. Kai propped herself up on her elbows. She was lying on a straw mat in a large open hut. Several injured people were lying on similar bedrolls, and the room was filled with hushed groans and whispered prayers. The smell of blood and smoke was thick in the air, and the iron tang stung Kai's nostrils. Where am I? We're still in the village. After you collapsed, a group of warriors arrived and drove the Drawker away. Are they still here? Kai asked. Yes, they put out the fires and are helping to salvage what remains. Kai forced herself onto her feet and stepped out of the hut. Her senses sharpened as she took in the chaos of what remained of the village. Homes were reduced to rubble, and the earth was scorched. Yet, despite that, Kai could sense the resilience of the villagers. Some of them were already at work clearing the debris. A group of individuals stood near Hikari, and Kai could tell by their bearing they were the warriors the dragon spoke of. Kai approached, and one of them turned to face her. 
You're awake. I feared the Drawker's fury had claimed you. His voice, though soft, cut through the air with a clarity that commanded attention. His gaze locked onto hers, piercing in its appraisal. My name is Rin. This is your dragon? Yes, Kai answered. She is unique. I've never seen one quite like her before. What's your name? Kai. You don't talk much, do you? Only when it's necessary. Thank you for helping me. My dragon is still learning and I don't think she would have known what to do for me. Rin's brows scrunched, but he said nothing. What brought you here? Kai asked. Your timing couldn't have been better. We've been tracking this group of Drocker for days. I wanted to catch them before they came across many settlements, but... He glanced around at the village and sighed. We weren't quick enough. I'm sure the people here appreciate your efforts regardless. You said you are tracking the Drawker. Where are your dragons? A pained expression briefly creased the man's face. Our dragons are no longer with us. Kai had heard of the Sundered before. They were sworn whose dragons had died, usually at the hands of the Drawker. Instead of returning to a normal life, they devoted themselves to fighting the creatures on their own. She offered a silent nod of understanding. While she had only been bonded to Hikari for a short time, she knew that to lose that connection was to lose part of oneself. How were you able to track the beasts? They hide their movements with magic. Ever since I was young, I've been able to sense the Drawker's stirrings. I thought it was something I gained through my bond, but the ability remains, even though my dragon is no more. It seems like the Emperor would put that to good use, Kai said. He probably would, if I allowed him to. When my dragon died, I severed all ties with the Empire. My brethren and I forge our own path. Kai admired his resolve, though she wondered why he didn't see the value of using his talent alongside the Sworn. Where is the rest of your contingent? Kai debated on how to answer him, and before she could speak, he said, You are welcome to join us. You're not sundered like us, but we're on a quest and could use your help, and that of your dragon. I have my own duties to attend to, she replied, but I am curious. Why would you need our help? We have a way to deal a powerful blow to the Drawker, but we are not equipped to do it on our own. That is where you and your dragon would help. Kai wished Kokoro was with them. She trusted the Elder Dragon's guidance, but she knew, too, that she would not always be able to rely on her. What is your plan? The Drawker employ underground caves to hide their eggs. I have found the entrance for one. If we can get inside, we can destroy the nest. Kai's eyes widened in surprise. The idea of destroying a Drawker nest filled her with both trepidation and excitement. Being underground to retrieve the Heart of Flame was harrowing enough, but travelling into the earth and being surrounded by Drawka was another matter entirely. It wasn't ideal, but it was a worthwhile cause if it was successful. Why do you need my help? You seem to have enough men for such a task. Rain smiled at her. Nothing can destroy Drawka eggs except dragon fire. You should know this. Is that true? Kai asked Hikari. It feels true. Although they are corrupted, they are a form of dragon. Why not go to the Sworn? They would relish the chance to strike at the Drawker. I told you already. I do not align with the Empire. There was something in his tone that gave Kai the impression there was more to his story than the loss of his dragon. But if he had a grievance with the Empire, that was his concern. How do you feel about this? I think we should consult with Kokoro. Hikari regarded her intently, and Kai could see her reflection in the dragon's blue eyes. I will follow your lead in this matter. If you want Kokoro's blessing, then we shall get it. But if you want to make your own decision... Kai didn't need to hear Hikari finish her sentence to know the dragon would follow her, regardless of the outcome. What assurances do we have that this will work? Assurances? 
Wren scoffed. There are no assurances in war. But with my ability, we will be one step ahead of the Draka if they sense our presence. Kai considered the risks. The bond we share with our dragons is... She paused, searching for the right words. Deeply woven. To have those threads torn from you. It is a wrong that cries out to be righted. She looked at Hikari, who lowered her head approvingly. We will help you. Chapter 6 As Kai stared into the black abyss, she questioned whether she had made the right decision. Hikari walked behind her, which offered some comfort, but the idea of being trapped below ground with Draka made her heart quicken. It had surprised her to learn the entrance to the nest was only a few hours' march from the village, but in retrospect she suspected that was probably where the attackers had originated from. The tunnel was wide and the air was cool. If Kai didn't know any better, she would have no idea the tunnel led to a nest of Draka eggs. There were no foul smells lingering in the air, and the silence was broken only by the echoes of their footsteps. Rin and his men were ahead of her leading the way, weapons drawn and ready, while their torches cast flickering shadows that danced along the rough-hewn walls. The further they progressed, the more Kai felt as though someone was watching her. It reminded her of the day before the storm hit Ikji. Ikji. She prayed that her parents were safe, and that Master Satoshi had successfully repelled the Draka attack. The more she thought about her parents, the more homesick she grew. I would like to meet your parents, Hikari said. Reading my mind again? Guilt from the dragon washed over her. It's all right, Kai soothed. It is odd sharing my thoughts with another, but it's also nice to have someone to share them with. I never... Memories of her childhood came unbidden, flowing through the bond. She was alone. There was no one to talk with, and other children were forbidden from playing with her. The emptiness she felt stung her even now, and her eyes welled with tears. She blinked them away. You are not alone any longer. Hikari's words comforted her like nothing else. Thank you for bonding with me, Kai said. Thank you for awakening me. I don't know how long I slept, but it was far too long. As they continued their trek, Kai's thoughts turned back to the task at hand. The air grew heavy and warm, and a faint odour began to permeate the darkness. Rin held up a hand, bringing everyone to a halt. He crouched down, briefly examining the ground, then rose back up and motioned for everyone to continue. The tunnel branched in two different directions, and Rin led them along the path to the right. After roughly fifty feet, the tunnel opened into an enormous chamber. Along the top of the cavern, moss gave off an eerie fluorescent green glow, illuminating hundreds of dark eggs that lay nestled in earthen cradles. Kai froze as she took in the sight. There are so many, she said. And this is only one of their nests, Rin replied. Once your dragon burns the shells, we shall need to drive our swords into what remains to ensure they are truly dead. Kai nodded and looked at Hikari. The dragon rumbled, the sound echoing in the vast hollow chamber that acted as a womb within the earth. She trudged forward and leaned her head down, expelling a torrent of flames on the nearest eggs. The heat washed over Kai, and she had to take a few steps back from the intensity. The fire faded and the eggs smouldered small tendrils of smoke rising into the air. Rin and his men set about driving their blades into the shells. Kai watched them as they worked. These were hardened men. There was no hesitation in their strikes, no mercy. As the sundered moved from one mound to another, their armour whispered with their movements. Feeling useless, Kai walked over to inspect their work. The shells were as dark as her sword, though it was hard for her to determine if that was their natural colour or from Hikari's flames. The punctures from the swords oozed inky liquid, and in one of them she saw the small face of a Draka, its mouth opened in a silent cry. Guilt washed over her. 
and she turned away from the gruesome sight. She knew what was at stake, understood what needed to be done, but to destroy life before it had a chance to begin was a grim task. She took a deep breath and steeled herself, then drew her sword and joined the sundered. Kai's fingers tightened around the hilt of her ebony blade in a steadfast grip. With deliberate steps she advanced to the nearest clutch of eggs and paused. The moment stretched taut as she raised the blade, the metal catching the light of the moss above in a sinister gleam. Her resolve faltered, and her hand tremored. "'We do what we must,' Ikari told her. "'We are the shield against the darkness, the sword against chaos. We are not killing innocent creatures.' Emboldened by her dragon's words, she thrust the sword forward. The impact of steel upon shell sent a resonant clang throughout the chamber, a sound magnified by the hollowness of the cave. Kai plunged her sword into another egg. Shards flew. One after another, the eggs fell to her black blade. The air grew fouler as they worked. The ichor that leaked from the eggs smelled like dead animals, and Kai's nostrils flared as she stifled a cough. She forced herself to breathe through her mouth, but she didn't find it much better, since she felt as though she could taste the stench. Hold! Rin shouted. All sounds ceased, and Kai glanced at him to see why they had stopped. After a tense moment that seemed to last an eternity, he said, Continue. The metallic chorus resumed, and after several minutes Kai paused to wipe the sweat from her brow. Her arms ached from the effort, and judging by how much of the cavern they hadn't covered yet, she estimated they weren't even halfway done yet. This is taking too long, she said aloud. Press on, Rin urged. We don't have much time. Are the Draka coming? His lack of an answer was all she needed. Kai glanced around the chamber, looking for an exit, but the light of the moss only illuminated so much, and everything else remained hidden in the shadows. "'Do you see another way out of here?' she asked Hikari. There was a pause, and the dragon replied, "'There is not.' "'We need to leave while we can,' she told Rin. "'If the Draka corners in here—' Rin yanked his sword from an egg and turned to her, a wild look in his eyes. He was consumed with bloodlust. "'If we die, then we die with honour," he snarled. The other sundered stopped and looked at him. Kai could tell they weren't all in agreement with his words. "'Your grief is my grief,' one of the men said. "'But hope has not fled from us. "'If the Draka are drawing close, I want to fight them on our terms, not theirs. "'Kai is right. "'If they catch us in here, we will all die.' "'Rin's intensity diminished, and when he spoke his words were calmer. "'I... I'm sorry. "'You're both right. "'I let my hatred for these creatures get the better of me. "'We have done what we can for now. "'Let us leave, and we can return to finish this later.' Kai was glad he could be reasoned with. She didn't want to leave the sundered down here, but she also wasn't going to risk death to destroy a few more eggs. Rin sheathed his blade and marched across the cavern, heading back the way they'd entered. Wait, one of the sundered said. There's something there, in the darkness. What is it? Rin asked. I'm not sure. You should look at it. Rin hesitated, but he turned around and walked over to where the man stood. He knelt and inspected where the man indicated. There's nothing. The man struck Rin on the side of the head, knocking him to the ground. Have you lost your mind, Shuji? What are you doing? The man, Shuji, pressed the tip of his sword to Rin's throat. No one is going anywhere until Kai gives me a dragon. Chapter 7 Shuji, you fool! You can't bond with a dragon! She's already bound to Kai. I'm not the one that wants her, Shuji replied. The Drocker do. Kai stared in disbelief at him. She barely knew these men, but she would never have suspected any of them would side with their enemy. You would betray your oath, Rin spat. My oath died with my dragon. Shuji paused, glancing at the other sundered before his gaze fell on Kai. I'm sorry, he said. The Drocker have power beyond imagining. Our fight is a lost cause, and I would rather live under their rule than die. Make your choice now. Or what? Kai asked. Or I'll kill Rin. His blood will be on your hands. 
"'If you kill him, you won't get far before Hikari flames you to death.' "'I'll take my chances,' Shuji said, pressing his sword down and nicking Rin's neck. A trickle of blood ran down his flesh. Kai's hand trembled on the hilt of her sword, her mind racing through the impossible decision before her. The tension among the other sundered was almost palpable. "'Your life will not be worth living under the Draker, Kai said. "'They consume everything. You know this. They may let you live for a time, but they will eventually consume you as well. "'I have no choice. They have my family.' "'We will help you free them,' Rin said. For a moment Kai thought Shuji would be swayed, but her hopes were dashed when he shook his head. "'Your words feel like silk, but they're nothing more than cobwebs in the wind. Now choose.' Hikari sniffed the air, turning her head toward the tunnel. "'They are coming.' "'Time is running out,' Shuji taunted. Kai took a step toward the traitor, and he pressed his blade deeper into Rin's neck, forcing her to stop. "'Let him go,' she pleaded. "'Give me your dragon, and I will.' "'That will never happen.' "'Then you will all die here, and the Draka will take her anyway.' As if his words had summoned them, Draka began to pour into the chamber from the tunnel. Kai's eyes widened in fear, but it was quickly driven away by anger. It sparked within her, swelling into a roaring inferno. With a defiant cry, she tapped into the bond, pulling from a hidden wellspring of power. It surged forth like a tidal wave, a torrent of energy that filled her very veins, setting every fibre of her being ablaze. Her sword reacted to the power its edge hungry for the blood of the Draka. It came alight with an ethereal glow, and Kai drove the blade into the ground. The air itself seemed to scream, charged with the raw energy that poured from her. It was as if the souls of the elders lent their strength to her, guiding her hand. An aura of black light enveloped her, and the chamber quaked. The Draka halted, looking around in confusion. "'Let him go,' Kai demanded a voice echoing through the cavern. Shuji's eyes darted between her and the Draka. Kai could sense his internal battle, torn between his loyalty to Rin and his desire to see his family safe. Finally he lifted his sword from Rin's throat, his eyes never leaving Kai's. The other sundered seized his sword and pushed him toward the Draka. The creatures charged, their confusion replaced with fury. Shuji was cut down mercilessly, and Kai felt a pang of sadness at his death. He had fallen for their tricks and betrayed his own kind. That thought fueled her anger further, and she rushed forward to meet the Draka, her sword slicing through the air. She severed the heads of those closest, and Hikari joined her, blasting a stream of flames into the Draka's ranks. Their screams echoed in the cave as they fell, but their fellows weren't swayed. They continued to stream in from the tunnel, their numbers unending. Emboldened by her display, Rin and the other sundered fell in beside her, hacking and slashing. Despite their valiant stand, Kai knew the power coursing through her wouldn't last forever. She scanned the chamber, looking for a way out, or at least some way to stall for time. And then she saw it, a hidden passage half concealed by a rock slide. There! she shouted, pointing with a sword. Move that way! The sundered followed her direction, slowly turning their back to it and retreating. "'Can you move those rocks?' Kai asked Hikari. "'I will not leave your side.' "'You must. It is our only way to escape.' The dragon snarled and released another wave of flames, then bounded away. Kai thrust her sword into a Draka and began walking backwards alongside the Sundered. With Hikari gone, the Draka crowded in closer, threatening to encircle them. A rumble filled the chamber as the stones were moved and then Hikari was at Kai's side again, swatting Draka aside with a claws. The way is clear. Everyone into the tunnel. Hikari and I will hold them off. The Sundered broke away and ran for the exit. Kai could feel the power she had tapped into rapidly dwindling. Once the men were safe, Kai urged her dragon to go next. You first, Hikari said. I have a plan, and I don't want you in the way of what's coming. Hikari's concern was evident in the bond, but she relented and hurried into the tunnel. Kai turned and sprinted for the opening, sliding to a halt as she reached the threshold. She turned back to face the Draka and drew in a deep breath, hoping that whatever was guiding her wasn't leading her astray. 
she held her black blade out before her, and closed her eyes, pooling the remaining energy into the obsidian stone in the pommel. The sounds of the approaching drawker faded, and time seemed to stand still. Warmth radiated from the stone, growing hotter with each passing moment. Kai could feel the energy preparing to burst forth, and her skin prickled with anticipation. A flash of light blinded Kai even though her eyes were closed, and she was thrown backwards as the last of her energy was released in a violent burst. As the light faded, she lay gasping in the tunnel, her strength gone. After a few moments she sat up, but her vision swam, and she slumped against the wall. When the nausea passed, she looked into the cavern. Tendrils of smoke rose from the stone floor. The Draka were gone, their bodies reduced to ash. Kai took a shaky breath and rose to her feet. Her legs felt as though they were made of jelly, but they held her up. She had no idea how she had wielded such power, but it had saved them. The cost was great, and she didn't know if she would be able to do it again. She searched for the well of power, but it was gone. No trace of it remained. Kai was startled from her reverie when she heard footsteps, but it was only Rin. He stared at her like she was a strange creature he'd just stumbled upon, but he offered her his hand. She accepted it, and he helped her up the tunnel. "'How did I do that?' she asked Hikari. "'I could feel the elders of the past guiding you, but otherwise I do not know. Perhaps Kokoro will have the answer.' They navigated their way through the passageway in silence, eventually stepping out into daylight. Kai sat on the ground and noticed the Sundered was staring at her. "'What is it?' "'You are the Blooded One,' Rin said. As one they all lowered to their knees and bowed to her. "'What are you doing? Get up!' "'We are swearing fealty to you, Kai. You are the one spoken of in the scrolls, and we will follow you against the Draka. Chapter 8 Despite Kai's protests, the Sundered insisted on following her and Hikari to Tatanongawa. They shared a meal to replenish their strength, and after a brief rest, Kai stood and walked over to the dragon, running a hand along her scales. "'We shouldn't stay here long,' Rin said, coming over to join Kai. "'The Draka are regrouping. You and your dragon should go. We'll meet you at the temple.' "'On foot?' If the Draka catch you... They won't, Wren promised. We know this land better than those creatures ever will. He clasped her on the shoulder, his grip firm but not unkind. What you did down there... I've never seen anything like it. I know you will turn the tides of this war. Kai doubted that was true, but she didn't say it. If the man believed it, who was she to tell him otherwise? I will see you at Tatanogawa, then, she said. Hikari crouched low, and Kai climbed onto her back. She offered a nod to Rin, who bowed his head respectfully. "'I'm ready,' she told Hikari. The dragon spread her wings and took off, climbing into the sky. Kai watched the sundered grow smaller, then turned her gaze ahead. It was an odd feeling having others view her as some sort of saviour. She had never sought attention or fame, nor did she want it now. But if Kokoro was right... Then Kai was the one from the prophecy. The wind whipped at Kai's hair, and she turned her thoughts to her parents. She missed them dearly. How did they feel that their other daughter had sided with the Draka? Were they appalled? Did they blame themselves for the path her life had taken? Kai envisioned her sister, which wasn't difficult. They were twins, and their features were so similar that when Kai had seen her, she thought she was seeing an apparition. As the temple's sloped roof came into view, she could see smoke rising into the air. "'Do you see that?' Kai asked. "'Yes.' Hikari picked up speed, cutting through the air, so quickly that Kai could feel her grip on the dragon's scales loosening. The temple grounds were overrun when they landed. Hikari sat down in the courtyard, and Kai leapt down from her back and drew her sword. A dozen Draka were trying to break through the temple doors, but Hikari dispatched them with a blaze of fire. Kai kicked their charred remains aside and pounded on the door. Kokoro, are you all right? There was only silence, and Kai's heart raced as she considered the worst. 
The doors swung open and Kokoro stepped out to meet her. You arrived just in time, the elder said. With your help we can drive them away. Have they attacked the temple before? Never. They have become bold indeed if they think they will overrun these sacred grounds. Where's Leia? Guy asked. Here, he answered, exiting the temple. He was wearing his armour and had his sword in his right hand. He wouldn't leave my side, Kokoro said. As if I need a protector. Come, let us make these Draka regret ever stepping foot here. The three of them spread out in front of Hikari. Kai stood to Kokoro's left, and Leo stood to the elder's right. A group of Draka came around the side of the temple and shouted battle cries, rushing toward them. Kai and Leo charged ahead to meet them, while Kokoro stayed close to Hikari. They were outnumbered by the Draka, but they had the advantage of Hikari's flames. Leo and Kai met them head on, their swords clashing against the Draka's weapons. Kai ducked under a sweeping blow, then thrust her black blade into the creature's midsection. The Draka let out a roar before collapsing to the ground. She pulled her sword free and finished it off, then turned to the next attacker. She tried to parry a strike, but she was no match for the creature's brute strength, and she staggered back from the blow. Leo came to her aid, his blade separating both of the Draka's arms at the elbow. Dark blood spurted onto the cobblestones, and Leo swung his sword in an arc, removing its head. Its body toppled to the ground. Thank you, Kai said breathlessly. Leo nodded in reply, engaging another of the Draka. The two continued to cut through the Draka's ranks, but Kai could feel a strength waning. It had been a long day, and exhaustion was setting in. She took a moment to glance at Kokoro. Use the heart, the elder urged. What do you mean? Kokoro's words were drowned out by the clash of steel, and Kai turned her attention back to the Draka in time to see a clawed hand. It struck her in the head, and the next thing she knew she was lying on the ground staring up at the sky. She groaned as she sat up and forced herself back onto her feet. Leo was surrounded and Kai cursed under her breath. She grabbed her sword off the ground and rushed forward, driving it into the back of the nearest Draka. Wrenching the blade free, she thrust the tip of the blade into the neck of another. Get down, Hikari warned Kai. She looked at the dragon and could see the dragon's throat glowing with orange light. Down, she shouted, tackling Leo to the ground. An intense heat washed over her as Hikari flamed the Draka. Kai rolled around, fearing her clothes had caught fire, but she was unscathed. Hikari's precision was miraculous. Impressive. Thank you. Hikari replied, her pride filling the bond. Kai helped Leo back up, then brushed ash from her clothes. That was a small force, Kokoro said. I fear more will come. It is obvious to me that your sister is directing them. Leo sheathed his blade. Let them come. We will slay them all. Do not speak foolishly, Kokoro chastised him. We are outnumbered, and there are no allies nearby. While Hikari and I were gone, we met a group of Sundered. They have pledged to help us against the Draka. They are on their way here. How many do they number? Only a handful, but they are skilled warriors. It is not enough, Kokoro said. You can transform into your true self. I'm sure the Draka would cower and flee at the sight. Kokoro smiled sadly. I suppose they would, but it is not possible. My spirit fades, and with it, my power. I hope to complete your training before... Kai frowned. Before what? Do you mean you're dying? Yes, I am dying. I have lived longer than any of my kind before me, and I am weary. But we need you, Kai said. We cannot defeat the Draka without you. You will be fine without me. I sensed a great power while you were gone. It was you, wasn't it? Kai nodded. Tell me what happened. Chapter 9 The setting sun cast long shadows across the courtyard as Kai recounted the events from her quest at the volcano. Kokoro listened intently, and her expression was grave as Kai finished. You showed great courage entering the nest of the Draka, but your greatest trial lies ahead. 
"'What do you mean?' Kai asked. "'To defeat the Draka is one thing, but to face your own kind is another. Can you strike down your own flesh and blood, your sister?' The question left Kai speechless. She stared at the elder in silence, her thoughts racing from one scenario to another. "'I cannot answer that. Not now, at least. It's not something I'd considered. I was hoping that you could save her somehow,' Kokoro smiled sadly. "'It is a pleasant thought, but I do not see any hope for that. In the end it will be you or her. Only one can prevail.' "'It can't be that simple,' Kai argued. "'I know I don't know her, but it doesn't feel right.' "'It is not simple,' Kokoro replied. "'But it is necessary. You should prepare yourself for what must be done. But enough of that. There is another matter we must discuss.' Kai was thankful for the change of subject. The thought of fighting a sister, let alone killing her, was hard to imagine. And yet she knew what was at stake was much greater than any sibling loyalty. The fate of the Empire hung in the balance. "'There is another item that will help you to defeat the Draka. It has long been hidden from human eyes.' "'What is it?' Kai asked. "'I had hoped to never speak of this relic, let alone see it used again. But desperate times call for desperate measures.' As Gokoro explained the nature of the item, Kai listened with a mixture of fear and awe. A cloak made from the hide of an elder dragon. The ability to move between what was visible and invisible. It seemed unbelievable. Yet Kokoro had also told her of the Heart of Flame, and that was real. The Shadow Realm, Kai repeated, murmuring the words. It is a place where light and dark coexist and time flows differently. It is a realm of great power and even greater danger. The cloak allows its wearer to traverse the boundaries between our world and the Shadow Realm, granting them abilities beyond mortal sight. Kai ran her finger along her leg. She found a seam and ran it under her nails. If this artifact is so powerful, why has it been hidden away? Why has it not been used before? Power always comes with a price. The cloak is as much a burden as it is a blessing. It has driven many to madness, consuming them with the allure of its abilities. Kai's unease caused her voice to break when she asked, And do you think I can wield it without succumbing to its influence? Your heart is pure and your intentions noble. But make no mistake, using it will test you in ways you cannot yet imagine. With your dragon's strength behind you, I am confident you will not be swayed. I will do what is needed. Very good, Kokoro said. Rest while you can. You will need to leave in the morning. The elder took her leave, returning to the temple. Kai was tired, but there was too much on her mind. She found a bamboo bucket and began cleaning the remains of the drawker from the courtyard. Considering they were piles of ash, it didn't take long for her to cleanse the grounds of the creatures. She washed the bucket out in the river, then filled it with water and scrubbed the cobblestones by hand. Kai could feel Leo's gaze on her as she worked. "'You have grown much in a short time,' he said. "'It doesn't feel like it. That is because you are focused on where you are going and not where you are or where you have been. When you only think about the future, you lose sight of the past.' Kai had to admit there was truth to his words, but she didn't say anything. "'You've become stronger, wiser, and more determined,' he paused. "'But there is one thing that I haven't seen change in you. Your compassion. It's what makes you different from other riders.' "'It's not my intention to be different,' Kai said, ceasing her scrubbing for a moment and looking up at him. "'Of course not. That's not what I was implying.' I merely mean that you don't see the world the same as others. That's not a bad thing. Guy smiled slightly, then continued her task. Do you think Kokoro is right about me? That I can use the cloak? That remains to be seen, but I believe in you. Guy's cheeks flushed. When she'd first met him, she thought he was nothing more than a rough soldier who'd been assigned as her guard. 
The more she got to know him, the more she realised there was more to him than a sword and armour. He was her friend. "'Thank you,' she said softly. "'For what? Everything? "'I haven't done much besides teach you to wield a blade,' he said, chuckling. "'But you're welcome.' Once Kai felt the courtyard was properly clean, she returned to the river and washed the sweat and grime from herself. The cool water soothed her aching muscles, and she felt somewhat rejuvenated. Hikari laid on the grass nearby, and Kai felt vulnerable enough to remove her clothes and clean them. By the time she set them on the river bank to dry, the sun was gone. Hikari used her breath to warm them, and after a few moments the moisture had vanished. Kai dried herself as best as she could, then put her clothes back on, and laid on the grass beside Hikari, watching the stars twinkle into existence. She closed her eyes, feeling the weight of the day on her mind and body. As she slept, she dreamed of battling the Draka, of mastering the power of the cloak, and of facing her sister. When she awoke, the sun was beginning to rise. Kai sat up, startled she'd slept so long. Oh, she groaned, rubbing her stiff neck muscles. Why did you let me fall asleep out here? I didn't want to disturb your rest, Hikari replied. It was all so nice to have some company, even if you weren't coherent. Kai got to her feet and stretched, then rubbed the sleep from her eyes. Her stomach growled and she realised she hadn't eaten anything before falling asleep. She made her way to the temple and found Leo standing in the courtyard eating rice cakes. He offered her some and she devoured several of them eagerly. You're not hungry, are you? A smile tugged at his lips. I've never felt hungrier, Kai said, taking another rice cake from his plate and biting into it. I don't think I moved the entire night. Using magic has that effect, Kokoro said as she joined them. You must be careful not to push yourself too hard. Kai finished chewing and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Where is this cloak I need to find? Kokoro pointed north. A crypt lies in Shaoing, beyond the Shinra mountains. Spectral guardians protect it and will challenge you. What kind of challenges will they pose? Tests of will, wisdom and courage. You must pass them all to obtain the cloak. Leo, I want you to go with her. Hikari should be able to carry you both, and Kai will need your help. Leo bowed his head respectfully. I have packed you some supplies for the journey. It will take you at least two days, for Hikari will not be able to fly the entire way without rest. Be wary. Shaoing was once protected by my brother, but he has been gone many years, and I am sure the Draka have taken over his temple. We will be careful. Leo said, taking the pack of supplies from Kokoro, and we will return as quickly as possible. Kai was grateful for his confidence. The only thing running through her mind was one question. Am I truly ready for this? Chapter 10 The sun cast a golden hue over the jagged peaks of the Shinraha Mountains, their snow-capped summits gleamed, and a chill wind nipped at Kai's flesh. She kept her eyes on the horizon, the monotony of the landscape below broken by the occasional glimpse of a wild game. Leo was seated behind her, his hands resting on her waist. Under normal circumstances it would have made her feel uncomfortable, but she knew he was merely holding on to her to keep from being pulled away by the wind. There was nothing more to his loose embrace— and she appreciated the warmth that radiated from him. They had been flying for a few hours, and Kai could sense the fatigue in Hikari's wingbeats. She patted the dragon on the neck comfortingly. "'You should rest,' she said. Hikari snorted in response, sending tendrils of smoke into the air that quickly dissipated. "'Land at the next clearing,' Kai insisted. A few moments later, Hikari descended to the base of the mountains, they landed with a soft thud, and Kai slid down the dragon's shoulder, her legs aching from the hours of riding. The wind howled between the peaks, the sound almost like distant voices. "'I'll build a fire,' Leo offered. As he set about collecting wood, Kai wrapped her arms around herself. The air was cold and thin, and it bit into her bones even through her clothes. 
She hoped Ikari wouldn't need long to rest. She hated the cold. Leo placed several sticks in a pile and drew his sword, swiftly sliding a stone up and down the edge of the blade. A few sparks came to life, but it wasn't enough to ignite the wood. "'Watch out,' Kai said. Leo looked up, just as Hikari huffed, expelling a small ball of flame that struck the pile and set the wood alight. He sheathed his sword and sat down, holding his hands out near the fire. Kai sat down opposite him and huddled as close to the flames as she dared. Hikari curled into a ball behind her and was soon asleep. Kai watched the flames dance, lost in her thoughts. She thought of her sister again and wondered how life would have been had things gone differently. Would they have still shared a bond with the same dragon? Or would one of them have faded from the bond for the benefit of the other? Perhaps it wouldn't have been her sitting here in the cold mountains on a quest to find an ancient crypt, but Akuhara instead. Kai looked up from the fire to see Leo staring at her. He broke the silence, his voice soft but edged with curiosity. Are you all right? You look upset. I'm just thinking. You're thinking about her, aren't you? Your sister? Yes, it feels wrong to abandon any hope of saving her. But you heard Kokoro. She thinks there is no salvation for her. Things don't always unfold the way we wish they did, Leo said. I know that doesn't help nor comfort you, but life is harsh. We must weather these things as best as we can without losing our humanity. Hikari stirred in her sleep and Kai glanced at her. Do you think dragons feel things like we do? Leo's brow furrowed as he considered the question. I think they feel everything more deeply than we know, but they don't dwell on the past like we do. They live in the now, in the heart of the moment. Maybe that's something we can learn from them. Kai contemplated his words. Maybe he was right. She couldn't control the events of the past, but she could sway events happening now. The wind howled again, louder this time, and Kai's gaze travelled to a rocky ridge. The sound was different, less like the wind and more like something alive. Leo noticed it too, his hand drifted to the hilt of his sword. Did you hear that? Kai stood, her muscles tensing as she peered beyond Hikari's bulk. Her breath hitched when she saw them, hulking forms, their silhouettes unmistakable. They were trudging down from the mountains. Drawker! Kai hissed. Put out the fire! Leo was already a step ahead of her, shoveling dirt with his hands and dumping it onto the flames. How many? he asked. Too many. Have they seen us? Kai hesitated. I don't think so. They waited in silence and watched as the drawker passed by their location. The creatures moved in a slow, methodical line, far different from their usual behaviour. Kai counted at least twenty, their bodies rippling with unnatural strength. When the last of them disappeared from view, Kai let out a sigh. We got lucky. If they had seen us... Hikari lifted her head, sniffing the air. I smell drunker nearby. They've passed through here already. Kai replied. Did you notice the direction they're heading in? Leo asked. Kai followed the path the Drawker took and realised they were travelling southwest. Do you think they're going to Tatanagawa? He shrugged. That's impossible to know, but Kokoro can take care of herself. We need to keep moving. If they catch our trail, we aren't in the best position to defend ourselves. Leo looked at Hikari. Are you rested enough to continue? Hikari stretched her wings and yawned. Kai could feel the dragon's weariness had lessened, but her strength wasn't fully restored. I can manage, Hikari said, projecting her thoughts for both of them to hear. Are you sure? Kai asked. Yes. The sun was in the middle of the sky, but despite it being midday, the temperature seemed to be getting colder. Kai wanted to give Hikari more time to rest, but she also wanted to be gone from this place. Let us get moving, then. We will stop again at nightfall unless you can't make it that far. There's no need to push yourself beyond your limits. Ikari rumbled her agreement, and Kai and Leo climbed onto her back. The wind picked up as they took to the air, but Kai ignored the chill. They soared above the snowy peaks, and the air grew so cold Kai could see her breath puff out in small clouds. 
They flew until they were beyond the bulk of the mountains. The air grew gradually warmer, and Kai pointed to a grove of trees. "'We'll camp there for the night,' Kai said. "'It'll provide cover, and we should be able to keep a fire going without worrying about prying eyes.' Ikari took them down, landing just outside of the tree line. Leo and Kai went to work setting up camp, while Hikari went hunting for food. They soon had a crackling fire going, and they shared a meal of fresh fruit and fish from the supplies Kokoro had given them. The wind eased as night engulfed the land, and the stars shone above the tree canopy. Kai's belly was full, and she lounged beside the fire, her eyes heavy. She was surprised how tiring it was doing much of nothing. "'I'll take the first watch when you get some sleep,' Leo offered. Kai laid her head down on her arms and closed her eyes, drifting off to sleep. Once again strange dreams haunted her. Chapter 11 Kai awoke to the chirping of birds. She blinked several times, confused at where she was. Slowly her wits returned and she stared at the charred wood and ash, all that remained of the fire from the night before. She sat up and looked around, rubbing her eyes. Leo was asleep, but Hikari was awake, keeping a vigilant eye over them. "'Did you find food?' Kai asked. "'I found a few deer,' the dragon replied. "'And I slept while Leo kept watch. He was going to wake you, but I couldn't sleep any more, so I took over.' "'Thank you. I needed that.' Kai rose to her feet and stretched. She had slept longer than she expected, and she felt fully refreshed. I scouted ahead last night. We aren't far from showing. How much further is it? A few hours, Hikari replied. Kai rummaged through the bag of food Kokoro had given them and settled on a rice cake wrapped in seaweed. She ate in silence and enjoyed the sights and sounds of the woods around her, Wandering away from the camp, she relieved herself among some bushes and found a small stream where she splashed ice-cold water on her face. She drank a fill and returned to the camp, gently shaking Leo until his eyes snapped open. "'Time to get moving,' she said. "'Hikari says we'll reach showing today.' Leo grunted and got up, rubbing sleep from his eyes. He ate a rice cake and drank from the stream, then packed their meagre belongings. They were gone soon after, cutting through the morning air on Hikari's back. A few hours later, just as Hikari had said, Shaoing came into view. A monolithic structure of weathered stone stretched skyward, its crumbling walls marred by deep cracks and overgrown with twisted vines. Hikari landed in front of the temple, a low growl rumbling in her chest. This place is not natural. It has been shaped by something old, powerful. Kai dismounted and slid to the ground, her boots sinking into the damp earth. She could faintly sense what Hikari was talking about. There was something in the air, a humming of some kind, but when she tried to focus on where the sound was coming from, it changed direction on her. Do you sense any drocker? Kai asked. Hikari sniffed the air and snorted, her nostrils flaring. I only smell the stench of decay. Massive stones had collapsed over the entrance of the temple, leaving an opening too small for a dragon. As much as she didn't like the idea of leaving Hikari behind, the dragon would have to wait outside for them. Leo and I will go inside, she said aloud. If something happens, I will let you know. Hikari stepped forward and attempted to lift the stones out of the way, but they were too heavy even for her. She grumbled and retreated, admitting defeat. "'We'll be back,' Kai promised. Together she and Leo crawled on all fours through the opening and entered the darkness of the temple. Once they were past the boulders and across the threshold of the doorway, they were able to stand. Kai's eyes struggled to adjust to the gloom. Pale phosphorescent lichen clung to the walls, casting a glow that did a little to dispel the darkness. "'Stay close,' Leo said, stepping in front of her. "'We don't know what sort of traps might lurk in these halls.' They made their way forward slowly, and the narrow hall they were in opened into a large antechamber. 
The walls were bare, and the stone floor was littered with dirt and small rocks. "'This place feels like it's been abandoned for a long time,' Kai whispered, her eyes darting around the room for any sign of the guardians Kokoro had warned her about. As if summoned by her thoughts, a shadow detached from the wall. It was tall, cloaked in dark robes that blended in with the stones. The figure moved with an unnatural grace, its face hidden beneath a hood. Kai's hand tightened on the hilt of her sword, but it made no move to attack. It stopped several paces away and pulled its hood back, revealing a skeletal face marked with runes. Where its eyes should have been were golden orbs that burned with fire. Why do you tread here? Its voice caused a chill to crawl down Kai's back. She glanced at Leo, who kept his gaze on the figure, his sword partially unsheathed. Pushing her fear aside, Kai said, I seek the cloak. You, you must, must prove yourself, yourself worthy, the guardian replied. How do I do that? Face, Face the trials. trials. If, if you, you are worthy, you will, will be given the cloak. cloak. If, if you, you fail, fail, you will die. The guardian's last words echoed ominously off the walls. Kokoro had mentioned it would be dangerous, true, but she hadn't said anything about possibly dying. Kai swallowed hard. You don't have to do this, Leo said. I know, she replied. Although she knew his words were true, she felt like she didn't have a choice. Kokoro hadn't steered her wrong yet, but the threat of death gave her pause. Kai thought of her parents, of the innocent people across the Empire who suffered from the Drawker. If she could save even one life by risking her own, was it worth it? She thought it was. I accept, she said. The Guardian's orbs glowed brighter. Very well. Hear my riddles, and answer correctly to pass forth. I am not alive, but I grow. I don't have lungs, but I need air. I don't have a mouth, but water drowns me. What am I? Kai repeated the words within her mind. Not alive. Grows. Needs air. Water drowns it. Her eyes widened with realisation. The answer is fire. Correct, the Guardian said, a hint of approval in its ethereal features. I am invisible, but I carry clouds. I am weightless, but I can move the strongest tree. I have no voice, but I make whispers and howls. What am I? Wind, Kai answered. Relieve the riddle was easy. She wondered how many of these she would need to answer. Correct. I am not alive, but I cradle life. I am patient, and I shape mountains with time. I wear no clothes, but flowers adorn me. What am I? Any ideas? Kai asked Leo. No, the Guardian hissed. Only you may answer. Kai considered the riddle for a moment, unsure of what could not be alive but could shape mountains. Her first guess was the wind, but that was the answer of the last question, and flowers didn't adorn the wind. She opened her mouth, then closed it, doubting herself. Finally, she decided on an answer. The earth? Correct. The Guardian's skeletal face turned serious. Here is your final riddle. I have no shape, but I can fill any form. I am silent, but I can also roar. I am gentle, but I can carve stone. What am I? Kai's mind was blank. She looked at Leo again, the panic on her face obvious. He couldn't give her the answer, but maybe he could provide some sort of clue. The other questions are all connected. Leo said. What connects them? The Guardian didn't object, so Kai assumed Leo's help was acceptable. She considered the other answers. Fire, wind, earth. They were all elements. Water, she answered. 
correct. You have proven your wit. You may advance to the next chamber. The Guardian's form flickered briefly and then dissipated in a flash of light, scattering motes of dust. Thank you, Kai said. That almost ended in disaster. Chapter 12 Upon exiting the chamber, they found themselves in a hallway. Kai expected another apparition to confront them. Instead, they found the corridor was empty. Strange symbols were carved into the walls, pulsing with an eerie glow. Kai reached out, her fingers hovering inches from a particularly intricate carving. It resembled a dragon's eye, and as she watched, the pupil dilated, focusing on her. She jerked her hand back. Did you see that? she asked. See what? She stared at the symbol for a moment, waiting, but nothing happened. Never mind, maybe I'm seeing things. They pressed on, navigating the winding passage. The symbol seemed to guide the way, glowing brighter as they approached intersections and dimming as they passed. Kai was lost in her thoughts, and Leo startled her when he suddenly stopped and grabbed onto her arm. Look! Ahead, the hall opened into a vast chamber, this one bigger than the last, and its floor was covered with stone tiles. Some bore the same glowing symbols as the walls, while others remained dark. This feels too easy, Leo said. I think it might be a trap. Kai took a cautious step forward, placing her foot on a tile bearing the familiar dragon eye symbol. It glowed brighter beneath her weight, but nothing else happened. I think we need to follow the path of symbols. The dark tiles probably trigger something. Leo nodded. That makes sense. Do you want me to go first? No, I'll go. Kai took another careful step, her body tense, ready to react at the slightest sign of danger. With each successful step, her confidence grew, but so did the pressure. One mistake could mean the difference between reaching the cloak and failing not just herself, but everyone. The glowing markings emitted heat, and the room became oppressively hot. Sweat was beading on her brow by the time she neared the exit. She hopped from the final tile to the threshold of an archway that led to a corridor with a dirt floor. Leo followed the path she had taken, and when he reached her side, they continued ahead side by side. A few steps in, the stone walls groaned and scraped as they twisted, sliding like immense puzzle pieces to form a labyrinth. I saw another door back there. Maybe we can... Leo's words were cut off by a resounding thud as a stone slab fell behind them, blocking the doorway. There was no going back. The labyrinth walls hummed with energy, and Kai rested a hand on one to see if she was supposed to use magic to direct the maze. The stone was cold and unyielding, but there was a strange vibration beneath its surface, a soft, rhythmic pulse, almost like... Leo stepped past her and the ground beneath her feet trembled. Kai pulled him backward. The walls shifted again, the stones grinding together as they formed a completely different path. Kai frowned. It changed... The walls that had been stationary moments ago had rearranged themselves as if they were alive. We need to move before it closes in or crushes us, Leo said. He started forward again, but Kai hesitated. He was right, but something about the way the walls moved, deliberate, methodical, didn't make sense. She looked down the corridor that had just opened in front of them, then to the side where another path had formed. The stones continued to grind and shift, but Kai wasn't listening to the sound of the walls. She was focused on the space between the noise, the stillness that came before each movement. There was a pattern. She could feel it, faint and elusive, but it was there. This place isn't just a maze, she said slowly. It's testing us. What do you mean? It's not about finding the right path. It's reacting to us, to how we move. We can't just charge through it. If we stand here, we're dead. Let's go this way. Leo strode to the left, but another tremor shook the floor, and the corridor sealed shut with a heavy slam. 
Kai's mind raced. The walls weren't moving randomly. They were trying to force them to make hasty decisions. It wanted them to panic. She didn't know how she knew that. She just knew. Every time we move, it changes. But if we stand still... Kai held Leo in place and gestured to the corridor in front of them. It remained open, though the walls trembled slightly. It waits. Leo shook his head. So, what do we do? Stand here? Not exactly, Kai answered, a voice firmer now. We need to move when it lets us, not when we want to. It's like a dance. Leo gave her a look of disbelief. A dance with a shifting stone labyrinth that wants to crush us? Great. We just need to listen. Kai closed her eyes, focusing on the subtle rhythm beneath her feet. It was like the beat of a drum. When the next shift came, she felt it in her bones. Now, she whispered, opening her eyes. She stepped forward and Leo followed without hesitation. The walls stayed still for a moment longer, but as they walked, Kai could hear the low rumble of stone shifting behind them. Her heart pounded, her senses heightened. They turned a corner and the ground trembled again, the path behind them closing off. Keep going, Leo urged. No, wait. Leo froze in place. Kai closed her eyes again, feeling for the pulse. The walls shifted, but only slightly. The path ahead remained open. She moved cautiously, pausing with every tremor in the stone. The labyrinth shifted around them, but now they were in sync with it, anticipating each change before it happened. The panic that had gripped Kai moments ago eased, replaced with a growing confidence. Finally they turned another corner, and Kai saw it, a wide archway bathed in light. "'That's it,' she said. Leo started forward, but Kai held him back yet again. "'It's not over yet. The exit is right there.' "'I know, but it is still testing us. It wants us to rush.' The pressure in the air seemed to build as they stood there, the walls rumbling with impatience. Kai held her ground, waiting. She could feel the pulse, fainter now, but still there. Walk, she said. Slowly. Leo fell into step beside her. They moved toward the archway, and the walls groaned, but they didn't close in. As they reached the exit, the pressure lifted, and they stepped through. The labyrinth sealed shut behind them. Leo looked at her. Remind me to never question your instincts. Chapter 13 the archway opened into a vast, tranquil garden. The ceiling above was lost in twilight, dotted with soft stars, and the ground was a lush carpet of green grass. Kai looked around, entranced by the beauty. A soft breeze drifted through the trees, carrying the scent of cinnamon and honey. Natural winding pathways stretched out in every direction, each one lined with flowers of a different colour. Statues of robed figures stood at intervals along the paths, their expressions calm and inscrutable. "'It's peaceful here,' Leo said. "'Too peaceful.' Kai nodded, her muscles still tense from the labyrinth. "'It looks like another maze, but I don't see any logic to this one.' As they moved deeper into the garden, the paths seemed to multiply, twisting and turning, until it became impossible to tell which direction they'd come from. There was no clear indication of which path to take, and every turn seemed to lead to another set of branching trails. Kai knelt beside one of the paths and touched the flowers. They were real, soft and fragrant. But as she stood, she realised something troubling. Each path seemed more enticing than the last. One was lined with radiant golden flowers, glowing softly under the twilight sky. Another was shaded by towering trees, their leaves shimmering silver. In the distance she could hear faint music, as though someone were playing a hauntingly familiar melody just out of sight. "'Do you hear that?' she asked. Leo tilted his head. "'Music, but where is it coming from?' Kai's heart skipped a beat as the melody became clearer. It wasn't just any music— it was the song her mother used to hum to her when she was a child, a melody long forgotten. 
She swallowed hard, her throat tightening. "'We need to be careful. This place is playing tricks on us.' Cockero had said that trials would test her will, wisdom and courage. What sort of test was this? Every path seemed to draw her in, each one more convincing with its temptations. "'How do we figure out which path leads to the next chamber?' Leo asked. Kai shook her head. She considered the previous tests. The garden wasn't testing her endurance or strength. Perhaps it was testing her ability to discern, to choose wisely. But how could she make a wise decision when each path felt like the right one? Her eyes drifted to a trail lined with glowing red flowers, their petals delicate but vibrant, almost pulsing with light. The temptation was there, tugging at her, urging her to follow it. But something about it felt wrong. "'I don't think we're supposed to follow what we want,' Kai said. "'I think this garden is designed to lead us astray.' The more we want something, the more dangerous it becomes. Leo glanced down a path filled with silver leaves, his eyes narrowing in suspicion. So we should ignore everything that looks good? Kai didn't answer right away. Her gaze wandered over the myriad paths, the winding trails, the intoxicating smells and sights. The music tugged at her heart, but she forced herself to listen beyond it. Somewhere in this garden there had to be a path that was true, one that wasn't about indulgence or desire. A statue caught her attention. It stood taller than the others, its stone face worn with age, but its expression was serene. Unlike the others, this statue didn't look like a noble figure or a wise elder. It was simple, unadorned, its eyes closed as if in contemplation. Kai walked over to stand before it. Its base was surrounded by plain white flowers, unremarkable compared to the rest of the garden. She crouched beside it, examining the inscription carved into the stone. The true path is the one that asks for nothing. I think this is the correct path, she said, standing. She looked at Leo. The other paths are trying to distract us with what we think we want. "'but the one we need to follow "'is the one that doesn't offer us anything at all.' "'Leo regarded the path in silence. "'This one doesn't have a glow, music or anything. "'If what you say is true, then you're probably right.' "'Kai smiled, and without waiting for his response, "'she stepped onto the path lined with white flowers. "'The moment her foot touched the trail, "'the distant music stopped.' and the shimmering allure of the other paths seemed to dim, as though the garden itself were retreating. Leo followed, his hand on the hilt of his sword, though there was no sense of immediate danger. The path twisted and turned, but the farther away they walked, the quieter it became. No illusions, no temptations. After what felt like ages, the white flowers thinned and the path opened into a small clearing, at the centre of the clearing stood an archway, similar to the one they had passed through before, but this one was overgrown with vines. As they approached the archway, a soft voice whispered through the garden, barely audible, but familiar. It was the same voice that had sung her mother's song earlier, but this time it held no power over her. She glanced back at the winding paths they had left behind, the colours and lights fading into the twilight, as they moved closer to the exit. Kai stopped before the archway, her mind clearer now. She understood the garden's purpose. It had shown her that wisdom wasn't always about choosing the most obvious path, or the one that promised the most reward. Sometimes the best path was the one that offered nothing in return. It was a simple lesson, but it was a heavy truth. The vines parted to reveal a dark passageway. Kai motioned to it and looked at Leo, smiling. "'I'll let you lead this time, if you want.' Leo took a long look at her before responding. "'Kokoro was right to send you here. You have a connection to the magic of this place. I will follow your lead.' Kai laughed and gazed ahead into the darkness. She couldn't shake the feeling that something dangerous lurked within, but she had successfully navigated through all the previous challenges— Surely this one couldn't be any worse than what they had faced so far.
could it? She stepped through the archway, and Leo followed her. Chapter 14 As Kai's eyes adjusted to the gloom, she saw they were in a circular chamber. The air hummed with an otherworldly energy that made the hairs on her arms stand on end. Before she could fully take in her surroundings, ethereal figures like the one from the first chamber materialised. "'We're surrounded!' she whispered, grabbing the hilt of a sword. She doubted the weapon would do any good against the spirits, but the feel of it gave her a small measure of comfort. The guardians raised their ghostly weapons in unison, their hollow voices echoing through the chamber. "'Prove your worth or perish!' The ground heaved, and from the earth rose several towering figures. Golems! Their bodies covered in the same ancient runes as the guardians. Kai unsheathed her sword and stepped backward. "'There's six of them,' Leo said in disbelief. Kai gripped her sword tighter, her eyes narrowing at the three golems that lumbered toward her. The other three went for Leo. The creatures gleamed with an unnatural green hue, and Kai suspected they were formed from jade. Their movements were slow but deliberate, and their weight caused the ground to shudder. She considered how she might defeat them. Stone could be cracked, chipped, or broken, but jade, especially jade fused with magic, was a different challenge altogether. Hikari's presence entered her mind. They are not flesh and blood, but they have weaknesses. Find them, and you will bring them down. Kai wondered how the dragon knew what she faced, but she didn't have time to ask. The nearest golem raised its arm, the sound of creaking stone filling the air. It swung downward with terrifying speed, and Kai dove to the side just in time. The impact shook the ground, sending up a spray of dirt and shattered stone. Leia was already on the move, his sword flashing in the dim light as he aimed for the joints of the golem closest to him. His blade met the jade with a metallic clang, but it barely left a scratch. He dodged a swing and backpedalled. "'We need a strategy,' he said. Kai was back on her feet, her eyes flicking between the golems and the spectral guardians that now ringed the chamber. The runes etched onto the golem's jade surface emanated a soft shimmer, almost making the stone appear translucent. "'They're connected somehow,' Kai said. "'The golems and the spirits. "'What happens if you break that connection?' Kai didn't know but his question gave her an idea. One of the golems took a step to order. She sprinted forward to meet it, slashing her sword at the glowing runes etched along its arm. Her sword sparked against the jade, and she felt the magic briefly flicker. That was it, the magic. "'Aim for the symbols!' she shouted. "'That's the key!' Leo nodded, his face grim with focus. He darted past one golem, ducking beneath its heavy arm, and brought his blade down on the runes of its leg. The jade flared with a burst of light, and a deep crack appeared where his sword had struck. "'It's working!' he said, dodging another swing. "'We just need to—' Before he could get the words out, another golem barrelled forward, moving faster than its size suggested was possible. Its massive arm swung toward Leo, who barely had time to react. Kai's heart leapt into her throat as the blow connected, sending Leo flying backward. He crashed against the wall and slid to the ground, unconscious. "'Leo!' Kai sprinted forward, her sword slicing through the air with precision, her black blade connected with the largest rune on the first golem's chest, and a web of cracks spread across its torso. The golem faltered, its movements slowing as its magic began to unravel. That sent the others into a frenzy. Ducking low, Kai ran to Leo's still form and stood in front of him. The golem Leo had struck drew closer, and Kai plunged a sword into the weak point he'd created in the creature's leg. With a loud crack, the limb shattered, sending the golem toppling to the ground with a deafening crash. That left four still standing. They wasted no time in closing in. The guardians watched in silence, their gazes unwavering. Kai remained protectively in front of Leo's body, her mind racing for a plan to defeat the remaining golems. Thinking about the cracks she had created in the first golem, Kai focused her attention on exploiting those weaknesses in the others, Ignoring the looming danger, she darted between the advancing golems, striking at their glowing runes. With each hit, cracks spiderwebbed across their jade bodies, the chamber echoing with every strike. Kai fought with all the strength she could summon, but her energy was quickly fading. 
The weight of the situation pressed down on her, and she feared the end was near. Her breaths were laboured, and sweat made her clothes stick to her skin. She felt constricted, her movements growing sluggish. She stumbled and fell, landing hard on the ground, and her sword clattered as it bounced out of reach. Kai frantically searched for the magic that she had tapped into before, but it eluded her. The remaining golems advanced, and Kai saw her life flash before her eyes. She wanted to get up to keep fighting, but her muscles felt like lead. The massive creatures towered over her, and one of them raised its foot to crush her. Kai braced herself for the blow, but a battle cry startled her. She saw Leo on his feet, blood running down the side of his face from a wound on his head. He slammed his sword against the side of the golem about to step on Kai, which threw the creature off balance. It fell to the ground, and the others turned their attention to him. Kai forced herself up and crawled on all fours to get to her sword. She snatched the blade up and stood, turning just in time to see the golems converge on Leo. No! He crumpled under their blows and lay still. Kai's vision blurred, and her arms trembled. She reached inward, feeling for the threads of magic that bound her to Hikari. At first they slipped through her grasp. It was like trying to catch water in her hands. With a guttural shout she tried again, and this time she managed to grab hold of it. A surge of raw power erupted from her. It slammed into the golems, pinning them against the wall. Their runes flared as if trying to resist her, but they burned away under her fury, the magic roaring like an untamed fire. The agony of watching Leo fall had unlocked something primal within her. The wave of energy caused the spectral guardians to flicker like candle flames caught in a breeze. With a sharp cry, Kai directed everything at the golems. Their jade bodies splintered into a thousand pieces, creating a deadly storm of shards as the debris whipped about the chamber. Kai released the magic and staggered over to Leo's body. She dropped to her knees beside him, her hands trembling as she checked for a pulse. It was faint and quickly fading. Dread washed over her. He was dying, and it was all her fault. Chapter 15 you have proven yourself worthy. The Guardian's words meant nothing. Tears blinded her and she cursed herself for allowing Leo to come with her. If he'd have stayed behind with Kokoro... You would be dead, Hikari said, her voice penetrating Kai's grief. He sacrificed himself to save you. Kai wiped her tears away and looked at the Guardian. It stood there impassively. Can you help him? she asked. He is beyond all help. Kai gasped and threw herself on top of Leo's body, tears falling freely. He had been more than a mentor to her. He had been her friend, perhaps her only friend. Hikari's presence filled the bond, and a wave of comfort washed over her. It dulled the pain, but it didn't diminish it. Time ceased to exist as she laid there, after a while, the tears stopped. She lifted her head to look for the guardians. They were gone, and in the centre of the room stood a pedestal. Unfamiliar magic radiated from it, and Kai slowly stood. A shimmering mass of darkness sat atop the pedestal. Kai approached cautiously, fearing there might be another test. She couldn't handle anything else. The cloak rippled like liquid night its edges blurring and reforming in a mesmerising pattern. Flecks of starlight danced across its surface, hinting at the vast power within its folds. A conflicting mix of emotions churned within her. Kokoro said this cloak could help her defeat the Drocker, but at what cost? What would wielding such power do to her? Power always comes with a price, Hikari told her. But you have a pure heart and a just cause. If anyone can master it without being consumed, it's you. She sounded like Leo. The tears stung her eyes again and she gritted her teeth against the pain. Pushing the agony aside, she grabbed the cloak. As soon as her fingers touched it, her eyes widened. The cloak seemed to be alive beneath her touch, its inky fabric undulating. It's terrifying, she said. Take it. Kai lifted it from the pedestal. 
The weight of it surprised her. It felt both impossibly light and immeasurably heavy at the same time. With a fluid motion, she swung the cloak around her shoulders and drew it close. The moment it settled upon her, the world began to shift and blur. Darkness swirled at the edges of her vision, and she felt a peculiar sensation of being both present and elsewhere simultaneously. "'Where did you go?' Ikari's voice sounded distant, as if from underwater. Kai struggled to focus, her perception constantly shifting between the physical world and something other. Shadows danced around her, whispering secrets of ancient power and forgotten realms. She could sense the very fabric of reality bending and warping around her. Ikari, can you hear me? It's overwhelming. I can see everything. The shadows, they're alive, and I can move through them, become one with them. As she spoke, she felt herself slipping between realms, her body fading in and out of visibility. The boundaries where light and dark, physical and ethereal, blurred into meaninglessness. She was everywhere and nowhere, a being of shadow and substance. This power is more than I could have imagined. Control it, Hikari said, fear and awe mingling through the bond with her words. You must control it. With a monumental effort of will, Kai forced herself to solidify, anchoring herself firmly in the physical realm. She squared her shoulders and the cloak rippled around her like living darkness. She looked at Leo's body. The pain was still inside her, but it was distant now, as if many years had passed since his death. "'You deserve a better resting place than this,' she said softly. Kai lifted his body, cradling him in her arms. She thought he would be heavier but perhaps she had grown stronger than she realised. Using the power of the cloak, she slipped into the shadow realm and walked through the walls, leaving the temple. She solidified and blinked against the harsh sunlight. Hikari regarded her curiously for a moment. "'We will bury him at Tatanugawa,' Kai said. The dragon lowered her body so Kai could climb onto her back, and while still holding Leo's body, Kai heaved herself up, every muscle trembling. She situated herself, and Hikari launched into the sky. The wind buffeted them, but Kai kept one hand tightly wrapped around Leo, and the other held on to Hikari's scales. "'How did you know what I face in there?' Kai asked. "'We are bound as one. There were moments I could see through your eyes and hear what you heard.' Did you help me with any of the trials? No, Hikari said solemnly. I wanted to, but they forbade me. Who? The Guardians. Kai sat in silence, her eyes tracing the shapes of Hikari's scales as she got lost in her thoughts. Leo had died to save her, and she would never forget that. With the heart, and now the cloak, she would do whatever was necessary to bring an end to the Draka. The next two days seemed to last an eternity, but eventually Tatanogawa grew visible in the distance, the temple rising like a dark sentinel against the horizon. Kai was relieved to see it, but she noticed smoke lazily curling into the air from one of the smaller courtyards. Hikari roared and flapped her wings harder. Even from this distance Kai knew the Draka had returned. She prayed to her ancestors that Kokoro was safe, but something deep down told her the Elder was in trouble. As Hikari descended, Kai could see shattered statues and splintered gates. The temple grounds swarmed with Draka, and there was no sign of Kokoro. Do you sense her? She is alive, but they have taken her captive. She says your sister is here. Chapter 16 Kai's heart skipped a beat. Akuharu was here? Rage and disbelief warred within her as Hikari began her descent. Land away from the temple, Kai said. Hikari obliged, taking them down near the river. They landed with a thud, and Kai slid off Hikari's back, her knees buckling for a moment beneath the weight of Leo's body. 
He seemed heavier now, and his limbs had stiffened at odd angles. She gently laid him on the grass, brushing a strand of hair from his face. "'Stay here. I will find Kokoro and return.' Hikari rumbled her displeasure. "'I will come with you.' "'No. I can use the cloak to get in unseen, but the Draka will spot you easily. I will be back as quickly as I can.' They stared at one another for a moment before Hikari nuzzled Kai in the chest. If anything happens to you, I will destroy everything in my path. Tears came unbidden to Kai's eyes at the dragon's words. She had never felt a love as deep as she shared with the dragon. Blinking the tears away, she rubbed the scales on Hikari's snout and turned toward the temple. Smoke clung to the structure's eaves, curling into the sky like a serpent. The once sacred grounds were now defiled with the presence of the Draka, Kai balled her hands into fists, the cloak shifting around her, responding to the rise of her anger. The temple was almost unrecognisable, looking more like a battlefield than a place of peace. Pulling the cloak tighter around her, Kai faded from view, slipping into the shadows. Her body became one with the darkness, the sensation disorienting her briefly. The cloak seemed to guide her, and she moved through the ruins like a wraith, a form shifting between realms. She found Kokoro in the heart of the temple. Her wrists were bound together with heavy, shimmering cord that pulsed with dark energy. Her face was pale, her eyes half-lidded. Kokoro, Kai whispered, materialising beside her. The elder's eyes fluttered open, recognition flashing across her face. You found it? I did. What happened here? I tried to fight them off, but they're too strong. Your sister... Where is she? Before Kokoro could respond, a slow, deliberate clap echoed through the chamber. Kai whirled around, her heart pounding. There, standing at the far end of the room, was Akuhara. Little sister, have you come to sway your loyalty to me? Kai drew a sword and scowled at the woman. They might share the same blood, but Akuhara was no sister to her. She wore the same dark robes as she had at Ikshi. Behind her stood two hulking Draka, their eyes full of malice. "'What are you doing here?' "'I'm cleaning the filth,' Akuhara said, glancing behind her at Kokoro, her upper lip curling with disdain. "'I won't let you harm her.' Akuhara chuckled darkly, a sound that sent a shiver down Kai's spine. "'What do you plan to do? If you stand in my way, you will die.' "'Why are you helping them? They want nothing but destruction.' You're a fool. Our mother spoiled you and made you weak. I don't help them, I lead them. And at my direction they will change the order of things. The empire will crumble, and in its place will be something new, something better. You can be a part of it, if you bend the knee. Swear your allegiance to me. I will not bow to you, Kai said. Ever. Then you have chosen death. Akuhara drew her blade, a curved katana that gleamed as though it was forged from silver, the two women encircled each other, the air between them as taut as a bowstring. They rushed forward at the same time, the clash of steel ringing out like a struck gong. Kai gritted her teeth and slid her blade along Akuharo's in a shower of sparks, pushing back with a grunt of effort. Her sister smiled, twirling away and flicking her wrist. Dark tendrils of energy spiralled from her fingertips toward Kai's face. Without hesitation, Kai brought her blade up and blocked them, a sword ignited with a brilliant orange light, devouring the tendrils. Akuhara hissed and unleashed another spell. Kai leaped back just in time. The ground where she'd been exploded into a shower of black energy, jagged cracks spreading across the temple floor. Kai could feel something flowing through the bond, an ancient wisdom from elders long past. She extended her hand and flames erupted around her arm, Jerking her arm forward, the fire soared through the air in a blazing crescent. Akuhara dodged to the side, summoning a magical shield that took the brunt of the damage. What remained of it continued onward, striking the wall next to one of the Draka. The brute didn't budge other than to snarl. Kai closed the distance, her sword a blur of motion. She brought it down in an arc, aiming for Akuhara's exposed side. The woman twisted her body at the last second, parrying the strike, then sent a blast of dark magic that sent Kai backward, her boots skidding across the cracked tiles. She winced, her muscles aching from the impact. 
but she regained her stance. Pulling from their bond, Kai channeled the power into a protective ring of fire around herself. In a blur of emotion, Akuhara darted forward, her dark magic snuffing out the flames as she crossed the barrier, jabbing her sword at Kai's stomach. Kai parried the strike, but Akuhara suddenly changed direction, her blade coming dangerously close to Kai's throat. Kai leaned back so far she almost toppled over, but she managed to keep her balance and avoid being struck. She could feel her sword begging for the blood of the Drawker, and the cloak wanted her to submit herself to the Shadow Realm. It was almost too much. Ikari's presence filled her mind, giving her renewed strength. She pushed the distracting whispers of her weapons aside and screamed. Flames enveloped her sword again. She attacked Akuhara relentlessly, pushing her back with every strike, a fiery blade leaving trails of scorched air in its wake. Her sister snarled, frustration scrunching her face. With a wave of her hand she summoned a dome of swirling black energy. It expanded outward, forcing Kai to backpedal as the dome writhed and twisted. Kai narrowed her eyes, gripping her sword tighter. She took a deep breath, centering herself. Then, with a sharp exhale, she focused the flames to the tip of her sword. In one swift motion she lunged forward, her sword cutting through the air like a comet. The flames roared, a concentrated beam of fire that pierced through Akuhara's dome, shattering it. The force rippled through the air, sending the two Draka slamming against the temple walls and blasting a hole to the outside. Stone and timber debris flew in every direction. Kai pressed on, slashing and jabbing Akuhara into a retreat that took them outside. Akuhara tripped and fell flat on her back. Kai stood over her and extinguished the flames from her sword, then pressed the tip of her blade against her sister's throat. It's over, Kai huffed. Akuhara's lips curled into a smirk. You've already lost and don't even know it. A roar split the sky, and Kai snapped her head up to the heavens. A massive shape hurtled toward the courtyard. It was the grey dragon from Ikje, the one bonded to Akuhara. The dragon landed with a sound like a mountain breaking, and the shockwave sent Kai staggering. I'm coming, Ikari shouted. Draka poured around the dragon's bulk, rushing to the aid of their leader. Akuhara rolled away, and a wave of intense heat washed over Kai as the grey dragon unleashed his flames. Her first instinct was to fall into the Shadow Realm, but the heart of flame called to her, insistent. She acknowledged the stone, and as the flames reached her they parted on either side, leaving her unscathed. Akuhara's eyes widened briefly, and Kai found satisfaction in her surprise. She pulled the heart out of her bag and palmed it, then gripped the hilt of her sword. With the heart, the cloak, and the ancient magic that flowed through the bond, she felt as if nothing could stop her. With a cry that didn't sound like her voice, Kai unleashed everything she could summon. Fire, earth, wind, water, shadow, they all converged. The sky darkened and the wind howled, bending trees. The earth split and heaved, and a maelstrom of fire erupted from the fissure its tongues licking the sky. Lightning bolts blasted down from the sky, striking the grey dragon repeatedly. It roared in anger and pain. Akuhara staggered back, looking to her injured dragon. Draka fell into the fissure, burnt to ash within seconds. Kai wanted everything to burn, and she forced more power into the mix. The courtyard fell away into oblivion. This was the power of a true dragon rider, the power of the elements themselves. It was the power to destroy all that existed, but also to protect it. Kai regained control of herself and stopped the magic. The winds began to die and the flames subsided. The earth sealed back up, leaving a mark that resembled a scar. Retreat! Akuhara screamed. The Draka that remained didn't need to be told twice. They fled, their withdrawal a disorganised, chaotic mess. Akuhara climbed onto her dragon's back and he leaped into the air. His scales were blackened in several spots, and he flapped his wings awkwardly. Akuhara stared at her with hatred, and the dragon turned and left. Chapter 17 Kai's body cried out for rest, but she went inside the temple and knelt beside Kokoro. The elder was alive, but barely. Her breathing was shallow, and she looked as though she were fading quickly. Hikari's bulk blotted out the light as she stuck her head through the ruins of the temple wall. Kokoro, you're safe now, Kai whispered. 
her voice hoarse and fragile. They're gone. You're stronger than I thought you'd be. This power is more than I can handle. You will learn, Cockerow replied, each word a labour of effort. Speak the oaths. Kai's brow furrowed in confusion. What? The oaths? Kai realised what she meant, and she glanced at Hikari. Do you know the words? They are inscribed in my blood. Kai nodded and turned back to Kokoro. She brushed soot-stained hair from the elder's face, a touch tender, almost fearful, as if she were afraid to hurt her. Kokoro's eyes slid shut, and for a moment Kai thought she was gone. Kokoro spoke again, but it was barely above a whisper. Hurry! By the sacred flame and the ancient bond we share, I vow to uphold the honour of our ancestors, to protect our lands and its people with courage and wisdom. With my dragon as my guide and my strength, I pledge my life to the guardianship of our realm, now and for all eternity. By the breath of fire and the skies we saw, I vow to honour our ancient bond to protect our lands and its creatures with might and grace. With my rider as my heart and my spirit, I pledge my life to the guardianship of our realm, now and for all eternity. You are no longer chosen. You are sworn. A final breath escaped Kokoro's lips, and she went still. Kai wanted to cry, but no tears would come. There would be a time for them, she knew, but it was not now. She stood, her movements slow. Exhaustion threatened to overtake her, but she pushed through it. There was one more thing to be done before she could rest. She needed to bury her friends. Hikari dug two deep graves, and Kai placed Leo's body in one and Kokoro's in the other. She stared at them for a long moment, not knowing what to say. There were no witnesses other than Hikari, but it felt wrong to say nothing. Eventually she decided on her words. You have found peace from this world. I will hold you in my heart, grateful for the time we shared. Thank you for everything you taught me. She nodded at Hikari, and the dragon filled the graves with dirt, using her claws to pack it down tightly. Where do we go from here? Kai turned her gaze to the horizon in the direction Akuharo had fled. We go to end this, once and for all. This has been Acolyte, Bound by Blood, Book Two, by Richard Fierce, narrated by Kevin E. Green. Copyright 2024 by Richard Fierce. Production copyright. 2024 by Richard Fierce.